Hello. My name is Bob Archer, and it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Eric Zilmer, who will be presenting a master lecture on the psychology of terrorists. Dr. Zilmer is director of athletics and the Carl R. Pacifico Professor of Neuropsychology at Drexel University in Philadelphia. He received his bachelor's degree from Rutgers University, his master's and doctorate degree in clinical psychology from Florida Tech. Dr. Zilmer completed his internship training at the Eastern Virginia Medical School and a postdoctoral fellowship in clinical neuropsychology at the University of Virginia Medical School under the supervision of Dr. Jeffrey Barth. It was my great fortune to work with Eric during his internship at the Eastern Virginia Medical School. And it was certainly clear to me and all the rest of the faculty at EVMS that he was destined for some great accomplishments even at that early stage in his career. We just underestimated how many different fields he'd have accomplishments in. Dr. Zomer has been the cutting, at the cutting edge in a number of fields within psychology, including neuropsychology, personality assessment, military psychology, and sports psychology. But Dr. Zilmer also has another career and another life. He's director of athletics at Drexel University. And I think he may be the last director of athletics standing in the CAA, um, which is, if you know anything about college athletics, a major accomplishment. Dr. Zilmer is a fellow of the College of Physicians of Philadelphia, the American Psychological uh, Association, SPA, and the National Academy of Neuropsychology, for which he also served as president. Eric has written extensively in the areas of neuropsychology and personality assessment, having published more than 100 journal articles, book chapters, and books. And he is a frequent contributor to local and national media, including CNN, MSNBC, The New York Times, and The Wall Street Journal on topics including sports psychology, forensic psychology, and the psychology of terrorism. Dr. Zomer's books have been translated into a variety of languages for his international audience, including Czech, Chinese, Turkish, Korean, and Portuguese. The second edition of his text, Principles of Neuropsychology, has been used in over 500 universities worldwide. Dr. Zilmer is the author or co-author of two widely used tests in neuropsychology, the Tower of London, and the English version of the D2 test of attention. His text, Military Psychology, which is now in its second edition, examines the psychological context involved in the most recent military initiatives and geopolitical events. Related to the publication of military psychology, Dr. Zilmer was invited by the Department of Defense and the Pentagon as a distinguished visitor to travel to our naval base at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, and by the Pennsylvania National Guard to visit the war-torn Bosnia. Please join me in welcoming my friend, Dr. Zilmer. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to present to you today uh, the psychology of terrorists. And the purpose of this is to look at the context of the psychology of terrorists as I see it within the framework of personality assessment and personality theory. I like to think of the behavior of, that terrorist perpetrators engage in as being so wide and complex that I think it can serve as a framework for understanding behavior. And finally, uh, uh, join me, please, in, in trying to find out and answer the question that is, under what circumstances are humans more likely to be recruited to and engage in terrorism? And that's the topic of the master lecture. And thank you for inviting me, and thank you for the introduction, President Archer. Well, let's start with what is the definition of terrorism? As you can imagine, it's not easy. There are over 100 definitions of terrorism. The one I like is as follows. The unlawful use of threat of violence against persons or property for further political or social objectives. I like this because it's very broad-based and it sets the bar very low. So with this definition, bullying 
or domestic abuse would be considered terrorism. But if you look at the national media, you know, a lot of times in the, in the news, for example, I was in, involved in trying to analyze this, these Quantico killings. Three Marines were killed on, a, on, a, on the base in 2013, and it seemed initially that it might have been what the media would call terrorism, which is really terrorism as it relates to some international context. But as it turned out, it was triangular jealousy and it was basically uh, a relationship gotten wrong and all of a sudden all of the major news agencies kind of dropped this because it didn't seem as important or interesting. But of course, with the definition I just gave you, that would be terrorism too. It certainly would feel like terrorism if you were on the end of those behaviors, wouldn't it? But um, this is very politicized in our country, what actually gets labeled to be a terrorist event. This lecture focuses on terrorists. I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm interested in people. I'm interested in people's behaviors. I'm interested in the uh, behaviors of perpetrators. And many of you do forensic examinations and see killers and spree killers or other types of uh, forensics. And uh, I'm interested in those behaviors. And if you just extend them a little bit further, you, can, you, you get into terrorism. I'm not interested as much in terrorism. It's a, a social construct coming out of social psychology and political science. So I'm gonna stay with people and behavior. Now, this is actually hard to study because people don't raise their hand, uh, you know, who's a terrorist? Can anybody participate in my study? I, I used to work for Bob and I remember that Eastern Virginia Medical School got our research interests switched with our expertise. So instead of like Bob's expertise as adolescent assessment, and mine is neuropsychology, but they switched my interest and my interest was, uh, my research interest was Nazi war criminals and terrorists, so, so that was my patient population that was on the brochure. Eric Zomer sees Nazi terrorists and, and so I didn't get many patients, you know. <laughs> but I also didn't get many research subjects, so in fact, uh, when I was invited to go to Guantanamo, uh, my purpose there was to really interrogate the interrogators, so to speak. And one of the primary questions that they ask the uh, detainees is whether they are terrorists. And of course, the, you know, like, are you Al-Qaeda, are you Al-Qaeda? And uh, I didn't see this, but this is what was reported to me. Of course, they don't think of themselves as terrorists. They think of themselves as soldiers, liberators, martyrs, freedom fighters, or revolutionaries. Especially the term revolutionary is an interesting term because almost every but in the ICU I've talked to who is engaged in what we would consider terrorism thinks of it as a revolution. Um, there's many, you know, terrorism has existed since the beginning of time and it's as old as human society, but my lecture concentrates on the, these theaters of terrorism. Uh, these are the ones I study that I, I feel I have a, a good handle on. There's others like you can see in 1972 Munich, the terrorist group Black September went into a Olympic village. I'm very interested in that too. I was in fact there in 1972. But I, I sort of concentrated on the ones you see on, on the left. And the problem with studying terrorists is that you really, A, don't understand who is a terrorist. Nobody participates in a study saying they're a terrorist and you really don't have a lot of data on them. So uh, the ones that are highlighted in red, we have some data. On the Nazi perpetrators, we have over 200 Rorschachs and a handful of intelligence tests and TATs. On the Bader Meinhof uh, Gruppe gang, uh, a bunch of sociologists studied them for six months in prison and, and, and actually published an entire book. For suicide bombers, I have telephone interviews. With Al Qaeda, I have over 400 bio, uh, bio, bio, biographies, biographies. And with lone, lone wolves, I actually have seen some of them myself in prison and have actual real data on them. So this is what we're working from. There's a couple assumptions that I have about you know, this work. It's a really complicated work, it's very politicized. True, false, the first casualty of war is the truth. The answer would be true. In this context of terrorism, you can't believe anybody. You can't believe anything people say, any previous studies that have been made. It's very politicized. There are a lot of competing agendas in the work of terrorists. 
true false. There is no da more dangerous time in the history of our nation than today. What do you think, Bruce? No, Bruce, Bruce says that, that, that it was more dangerous back then, right? For example, in the 13th century, they built this castle known as Vaduz Castle. This is where the Principality of Liechtenstein lives now. Now, I'm not an architect, but you can't tell me that the people who built that building weren't really afraid of something. <laughs> so it's always been dangerous, of course. And uh, whether it's the most dangerous time now, I, it's a really interesting question. Um, and and I, I would say, I don't know. You know, this morning, my most difficult question was, should I get a latte or a collar macchiato? But when you watch television, you go like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen to this world? The only way to conquer these castles, by the way, is to siege them. They have their own wells. And then, you know, if you think it was great to be a prince back then, this is where the outhouse was, see, right there. So serve two purposes. True, false, is the United States at war? People shaking their heads, okay. Are we winning this war? Probably not, as far as I'm concerned. The war is called the global war on terrorism. Who's the enemy? How are they recruited? What's the terrorist decision-making loop and personality style? True, false. In the global war of terrorism, knowledge is the essential military tool, not weaponry. True, in my opinion, because if this was all based on weaponry, we would win every war that we get into. Okay, so in fact, you can argue that the single most interesting piece of information in the past was where is bin Laden? That was information that was probably worth $100 million if you knew where he was. And of course, they paid off his courier, they found where he is, and the rest is history. You can think of Guantanamo as an intelligent gathering institution. There's 4,000 letters that go in and out from the detainees. There's not only 70 there, but when I visited, there were 400. And they're all being read and, and, and looked at and deciphered. And whether, you know, Guantanamo is, a, is, of course, a political hot potato, and especially for our profession, it was really mismanaged. I approached it like an intellectual. I have nothing to do with it other than I visited it, and I looked at the facilities trying to understand, you know, how these detainees are being uh, incarcerated and what, are, what, what the plan is to, to, to deal with them. And the plan was really to get information from them. While I was in Guantanamo, I looked at the other side of the barbed wire through the hundreds of thousands of uh, mines, and I always thought, well, I want to go to the other side as well. So I did. I actually went to Cuba. Uh, when I landed in, in, in Guantanamo, the commanding officer greeted me with, um, welcome to free Cuba. And so I wanted to see actually the other free Cuba, which Cuba Libre. And so um, I was there this January, and it's a really interesting country. And while there, uh, I rented a red Chevy that you can see that we're driving with my driver, Gilberto. I re highly recommend this. But when we were driving through the countryside, they have these rest stops. And at these rest stops, they have this book in Spanish. I came back and bought it in, from Amazon.com in English. So Fidel Castro actually wrote a book on the unlawful use of Guantanamo. And so it was interesting to see from both sides. And, and in my opinion, just to tell you what I think, I think it's unsustainable in the long run. Guantanamo was, uh, was acquired legally in 1903 through a, a, a lease in perpetuity. And of course, Castro became uh, uh, leader of Cuba in 1959 through the revolution. And, and now it's really, you can't actually talk about it. You can talk about anything in Cuba, but you can't talk about Guantanamo. Another thing I want to put out front before we go into the ingredients of terrorists is what is military psychology? Because I think it's a really, interesting area of psychology is expanding. There's a lot of jobs in it. A lot of our students, we have a PhD program at Drexel, go into it. And I really feel that psychologists are finding themselves progressively more involved as consultants to the military, security firms, federal and state governments, intelligence agencies, and the police in the fight against potential threats. We have a great history of military psychology. 
Uh, World War I is really the official birth of military psychology in the United States. You know, you have to think that in the APA conference in 1918, all but one paper dealt with military psychology. So can, you can say we've come a long way, but only maybe my paper today, the opposite, deals with military psychology. World War II is interesting also for military psychology because uh, extensive testing was done using the uh, MMPI. I promised Bob I would mention it at least once during my lecture. And so really, the history of military psychology and history of clinical psychology is synonymous. And it is within the context of military psychology that the psychology of terrorists really gets discussed. And that context is called operational military psychology. Military psychologists do a lot of different things. There's seven, 800 full-time military psychologists and as many people who work in military facilities or veterans hospitals. And most of that work is clinical in nature. But operational military psychology is, in my opinion, one of the most interesting and most latest chapters in the development of this field, largely pertained to disaster management and the global war on uh, terror. I, uh, I, have a, I have a really good PhD student, Carrie Kennedy, Dr. Kennedy. She's now a commander in the Navy. And we co-edited this book. She got promoted. She got promoted? Captain, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna tell her that, you know, that I, can, can we erase that? And she's now a captain in the Navy and uh, we published this book and it's, and it's been really fun working with her in this respect. I had for the military psychology, I asked my good friend, Admiral Lynch, a four-star admiral to write the foreword. He said, I don't believe in psychology. I said, Admiral Lynch, you're a good friend of mine. I would run through a wall with you, for you. That's psychology, do you get it? Okay, he wrote the book, he wrote the foreword. Then I came one day, I showed him, Admiral Lynch, I'm so proud we have our book in Chinese. It's published in Chinese. And he looked at it and he said, Eric, this book and my foreword is published in Chinese? And then I realized that there was probably a mistake to tell him that. <laughs> but rest assured, that stuff gets translated all the time anyway, whether you publish it or not. So here's the psychology of terrorists. What are the ingredients? And I'm going to present this as if I was writing a psychological report on, the, on terrorists. And my first area would be reality testing. In other words, you know, most people think terrorists are crazed fanatics, and especially the security, security agencies uh, are dealing with them as if they were religious fanatics. But what's really the truth? So the first thing I would look at is the scale of some of terrorist organizations that have occurred. One is state-sponsored Nazi terrorism. We know a lot about them. They're, we know that between 150,000 and 200,000 were actively responsible for committing crimes. But we also know that many bystanders uh, looked the other way as uh, Hitler built his Third Reich. But these are really astronomical numbers. The picture there you see is of a 1923 rally in Munich for National Socialism. Uh, a lot of people got behind this. And so when you talk about reality testing, if you, know, you show people an ink blot, and a lot of people can see at least something that other people see, People believe in this movement. There was enough purpose in the movement that other people signed on for it. Okay, mind you, all the death camps were hidden in Poland, but by and large, people believed in this movement. More than 35,000 have been captured, brought to trial, and convicted. One of the greatest things I ever uh, was part of is writing this book, Nazi Personality, with Bob Archer, Barry Witzler, and Molly Harwer. And uh, I'll get you a signed copy, Bob, if you don't have one yet. So we, we've uh, got into more detail about the over 220 collaborators and leaders and what they might have looked like. One area in reality testing is what I call sympathizers. These are people who are not terrorists, but they sympathize with what's going on. They may not like the methods or that people died, but they kind of go like, well, you know what, they had a point. I believe that some people look at these following terrorist organizations favorably. You may disagree with me, and it's not that I'm saying you look at them favorably, but some groups do. I think the most favorable one that I just talked about, Cuba Libre Revolution, 1959, Che Guevara and Fidel Castro. In fact, this picture about Che was voted most iconic picture of the 20th century. Okay, this guy killed people, all right? If you had a disagreement with Che, you know, they would shoot you down. But by and large, people romanticized the revolution of Cuba 
and Che later was killed in Bolivia while still you know, being a, basically a terrorist. Another one would be Hamas, and that's a Palestinian militant group. They actually got voted into office in their own country. And this person, the Cat Stevens pop star that I followed for 10, 15 years, he is no longer allowed into Israel or into the United States because he supports them financially. This is the guy who wrote Peace Train. So the Hamas has, is, is favorably looked on by many different groups, especially the Palestinian themselves. The IRA terrorists uh, are interesting, trying to establish an independent or a, a one whole Ireland. And uh, in Boston, the US openly funded the IRA and was the primary supporter financially of this terrorist group. Mind you, you don't have a terrorist group without money. Somebody has to fuel them, either a state or people. Somebody has to give them money. Uh, Al-Qaeda, you know, when 9-11 happened, at the time my wrestling coach, uh, he, uh, he's, he was Iranian, and I said to him, like, what, what do you think, what do you think of 9-11? And he, says, uh, he said, you know, don't get me wrong, uh, Eric, but the Americans had it coming. I go like, what? What, what did they have coming? <laughs> and, and so I would think of him as a moderate Arab. And quite frankly, when you travel around the world and, and you, 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 you sense that there's a lot of sympathizers for Al Qaeda. They may, they may not agree with their methods. They may not agree with their ideology. But they send them money. And then finally, a controversial one is uh, our own revolution. You know, There's a new museum in Philadelphia called the Museum of the American Revolution. I live two blocks away. And I was astounded to walk in. I'm a founding member. And I, in, in the lobby, there's one big word that says revolution. And I was just thinking, wow, that's a really interesting word because many people have claimed you know, their own revolution, but we persecute them. But this is a good revolution, of course, right? We, we got the right one. We won. But if you look at that, you know, look at George Washington in terms of the tactics they uh, guerrilla tactics, as you know, the, the uh, British forces were outnumber, outnumbered us by a lot. And especially a group called the Minutemen were, like, were a civilian terrorist militia. And uh, I mean, you could, I mean, I had my class go there and I, I said to them, when you come back, I want you to tell me, where do you think George Washington was a terrorist? Because I was teaching a class called ISIS. So they came back and 80% said that he was. But I actually don't think he was a terrorist. And then later on, they told me that they probably told you what what they thought you wanted to hear, so I should have known that. Here's some unfavorable groups that I think are unfavorable. White National Organization, the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas, that's a, a prisoner group, they're scary. The White Aryan Resistance is a, is a white supremacist group started by a former Ku Klux Klan member. Now when they go uh, protest, or when they go uh, on a campaign public, there'll be more protesters in the audience than representative of that group. Somalia, uh, Somali pirates, you know, ISIS, uh, I believe ISIS is looked unfavorably on by uh, Arabs. There are mass executions. And what's, what's happening right now is, is ISIS is being defeated, not by the Americans, but by uh, moderate Arabs themselves. And then uh, lone wolves, which you talk more about, Kaczynski, Eric Rudolph, uh, Reed, the Unabomber, Olympic Park bomber, shoe bomber, uh, isolated people who nobody would identify with or send them money to. All three of them happen to be in the same prison. So this idea of sympathizers is really important because without them, you don't have a terrorist organization. Uh, one example is an example that I lived through called the Bader Meinhof Group. This was in Germany between the 70s and the 80s. And this group killed 47 people, wounded 93. They took 162 hostages, and they robbed 35 banks. That's how they, they got their money. But they also had a lot of people support them. And in fact, German polls suggest 10 to 20 percent of the normal population supported the uh, Bader Meinhof. Uh, what we call, they were called group, but now we think of them as criminals. Uh, now we call them the Bader Meinhof gang. Some of them are, they're all Germans. You may know of them, Gunter Grass, Heinrich Böll, John Paul Sartre, a French, and then the, the famous movie maker, Reiner Werner Fassbinder. So these uh, sympathizers are important because, because without them, you really have, uh, you, you marginalized a terrorist group. They're still dangerous, but they really are not as formidable as an enemy. There's a movie made on this called The Bader Meinhof Complex. I think it's excellent. It looks exactly at this area. My second area, 
of functioning and terrorist groups I call cognitive style. And here I divide uh, all terrorists into really two groups, those who follow orders and those who give orders. Those who follow orders, especially in the, in the state Nazi system, were Nazi official guards, people standing outside a, a Jewish-owned shop on Kristallnacht, uh, military personnel, bureaucrats, chauffeurs. And, but the Nazi elite were the people who actually created all of this nonsense, that created the concentration camp, the warfare. And you could look at almost any group, uh, a terrorist group, and, and, and divide it between uh, elite and rank and file. And it's true for any business. You know, there's, there's workers, there's middle management, and then there's senior leadership. And that's how humans organize their behavior, and they do the same thing for terrorist behavior. When you look at their rank and file Nazis, it's interesting that their cognitive style is oversimplified. They like to be told what to do. They're not creative thinkers. They're attracted to a rigid and quasi-military Nazi hierarchy. They rely heavily on denial. And they're vulnerable to acts of impulsiveness. This, what you see there, is a guard standing at Dachau concentration camp and he's been told, of course, to shoot anybody who approaches the fence. Those are his orders. My dad, on uh, April 28, 1945, his troops, he's a West Point grad, um, his troops, part of the 42nd Rainbow Division, they liberated Dachau. So I have firsthand accounts of my father coming to this camp. And so these Nazis are rank and file. They follow orders. And in fact, um, you may be surprised, but they really said that we just did what we were told to do. So Adolf Eichmann, I think of him as middle management. He's a controversial figure, of course. Uh, but he, in his trial in Jerusalem, said, I had nothing to do with the concentration camps. I believe him. I believe that he thinks, truly, that he had nothing to do with them. And I believe that those guards who all claimed that we were just following orders, that's truly really what they believed. That doesn't mean they shouldn't be punished for their behaviors. But everybody thought they were lying. But if you look at their cognitive style, that's how they function. So the rank and file Nazis have an information processing style that seeks out external structure, guidance, and reassurance. Many believe they were just simply following orders. And it's most prevalent among the rank and file. And these are the environments that the leaders of the Nazi regime created to to, to make them feel comfortable and at home. So this is a, a, a or floor plan of Dachau concentration camp. And what you see, it's all, right, you know, it's all right angles, left, right. And at their worst, these rank and file Nazis function in a binary world. Yes, no. Yes, do this. Don't do this. There's a Protestant chapel that stands there now. And the entire architecture of this Protestant chapel is round. There's not one right angle in this chapel to demonstrate, to, uh, to, uh, to highlight the fact that, you know, this is, this is not, this is, you know, to oppose this kind of thinking and architecture. Now, when you look at the 9-11 hijackers, you can divide them also into leaders and into rank and file and followers. The leaders are on the left. They're all the pilots, those four pilots and the four planes. And among those leaders is Atta, he came from Hamburg. He was part of the Hamburg terrorist cell. He had connections to bin Laden. He had personal connections to bin Laden. That's therefore we know that this was a terrorism act that was coordinated at an international level. On the right, you have, their, you have people that I would call rank and file. And there's evidence to suggest that many of those rank and file did not know what was going to happen on that fateful day that they were kept in the dark. They were just following orders. So you see how the psychology of, of terrorists uh, can be divided into uh, those who lead and those who follow. The only thing I would add to that is you can also divide it into terrorists that compose a group and terrorists that act alone. And I'll uh, say more about that. The next area is social and interpersonal functioning. When I came to this country in 1978, I grew up as an American overseas, but I would watch a lot of like Nazi movies. And I lived in Germany for 15 years as an American. And 
Those movies were like from the 60s and 70s, and they always portrayed Germans as stupid, as if you know they were didn't know what they were doing. And I was I lived in that country. I go like, wow, that can't be true. So this idea that you know terrorists are aloof socially, that they're the they're misfits, they're the unemployed, they uh, they they they're not married. They're, in a way, they're damaged. It's much easier to accept, of course, a terrorist who, who looks like that. But in fact, it's not true. And in fact, I would argue to you that terrorism, that the main ingredient of terrorism is attachment. And here you see, for example, a submarine where about 30, 40 of these men would volunteer to be on a submarine service. And in, in 1943, we know that of 100% of those submarines, only 20% came back in 1943 because the Allied forces had radar. And so they, which is the second worst record in the military history, uh, with the exception of kamikaze fighters, where 100% died. So why would these young men, Germans, go into a submarine? I believe it's because when we gave them war shocks, or somebody else gave them war shocks, we actually found that they had a lot of partial human responses. They were interested in, in, in having people you know, engaging with them. And they, they thought of it as family. They, 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 this was a community to them. They may not have had a, a good family at home, but it was a something that they were interested in. And as you can see it here, how they hang out. And they were just the opposite of aloof. In fact, I feel that it was the motivation that they would go into on a mission that's so dangerous. Now, you know this is true, too, for Americans. Like, many Americans did not believe in the Vietnam War. But once you were in the war, or if you're now in the war in Afghanistan, you would do anything for your buddy, wouldn't you? Isn't it great to be on a platoon and then they say like, hey, listen, we, we gotta do this, I'll do it for you. And, and they, there's an amazing amount of cohesion that, uh, that gets associated with these, these platoons or groups of people. It's true for sports teams, too. You know, it's just that in these instances, uh, they're dealing with life and death. So I believe that uh, many terrorists who get involved in groups actually seek out a social relationship. And we know that the, the London two bombers, they met at a gym. We know that the four Dick six, they, they met uh, around food. Uh, so we know that first actually comes, you know, socialization before, uh, before radicalization and the ideology. Um, so this sense of belonging provides a primitive sense of attachment. I think it's the core, at the core of many terrorist groups. It's a very seductive psychological force to bring people in. Everybody wants to belong to something. You can see this in Palestinian suicide bombers. We were able to talk, I was able to talk to uh, about uh, 18 of them via a cell phone. We were able to get a cell phone into the Tel Aviv prisons and we, uh, you know, there, this is a constant problem in Israel that Palestinians come into Israel with a suicide bomb and uh, explode themselves in a public place on a bus or in a disco. Back from where they come, they're celebrated. You can see the pictures from left. There's a mom with her son who, who was a suicide bomber. They're celebrated as murderers. And then you see a father with his son. Most, uh, a significant amount come from refugee camps. They put posters on in the cities, and, and then on the right, uh, far right, uh, you see also women uh, terrorist uh, suicide bombers. So you think, like, you ask your friends, like, how is this possible? Why would anybody put on the suicide vest and do this? You think they were forced to do it. But in fact, what we found out was, uh, when we talked to them, that they um, were asked by a community leader to uh, volunteer and uh, sacrifice themselves for their community. And so when we were able to talk to them, these are 18 young, uh, 18 men who either the bomb didn't go off, they changed their mind, or they were caught. And now they're in, in Israeli prisons for life. For, uh, uh, for life. It's an interesting question I ask my students, or I can ask you, what, if you had a cell phone and uh, you, you would be able to talk to them, what, what would you ask them? What would you, what would you ask them? I know what Bob would ask him. He would say, do you like mechanics magazines, true or false? <laughs> I, lo I love you, I want you to know that. That, that, comes, 
from a, from a place about from caring, all right? Well, I only had 10 minutes, so I asked them just demographic information. Like you would say, start a behavioral observation section in a report. You know, I found out that uh, they were 16 to 37, so 37 years old. So not really young. You know, the idea of just brainwashing them doesn't seem, seem appropriate. Uh, only a third were born in refugee families, which means the other ones are established families that lived in their location for a long time. Most of them were from Hebron. And 14 were single, but two were married and two were engaged. So this community, uh, community advocate, he asked somebody to sacrifice themselves who was married. That's amazing. But what I've learned now is, uh, looking at this really for 35 years, is that is the greater the sacrifice, the greater the sacrifice, the more meaningful it is as a terrorist act. And so the idea that these people were punished or did it under fear or if you don't do this, we're going to do this to you is not true. The other thing I asked them is how often do you go to a mosque? And I found out that they're all observant, but they go to the mosque like I go to a church twice a year, three times a year, maybe around the holidays. So religious fanaticism does not explain this. This is really a psychological process that's very complicated that deals with community uh, respect and community engagement. I asked him, well, listen, you're, but you're killing you're like young children. They're killing our young children. So. so when you look at the psychology of suicide bombers, they felt completely justified for their acts. They felt they had a loyalty and attachment to an intimate cohort of peers. There was no history that they ever had any mental uh, health touches or that they were ever picked up by uh, the police. They had an ability to empathize. They understood what they were about to do. On their scale, uh, and their socioeconomic scale, there was no poverty or despair. And they felt the biggest uh, sacrifice they can do for their community is die for one another. There's a movie that outlines this, which is actually made by Palestinian filmmakers called Paradise Now. I didn't watch the movie and then interpreted the movie. Okay, it's just a movie. I came up with my hypothesis first, but they, they're, they're very similar to what you see in Paradise Now. Al-Qaeda is another group, I believe, that shows you about the uh, social, social interpersonal functioning. We have, uh, my friend Mark Sageman has 429 bios on Al-Qaeda uh, operatives. We found out from those bios that 73% were married, that most have children, that no, none of them have criminal backgrounds and they, that they got into Al-Qaeda through pre-existing friendships, so two-thirds of them. Only 30%, 20 through kinship and 10% through like a school that was an ideological school got involved. And we also found out that the site of joining the jihad, 70% were in a foreign country when they were vulnerable, when they felt alienated from, from an ambient society. In fact, all of the hijackers uh, of 9-11 uh, were living in a country outside their origin of birth. And so, uh, so people are much more dangerous in, in terms of being recruited. The next section is self-esteem. When you look at the rank and file, they have by and large average to poor self-esteem. They feel they're victims of circumstance. There's just things happening to them. They feel like they're actors in the theater and these bad things are happening to them. They lack an internal moral compass. They're being told what to do and they do it. They're easily influenced by authority. In fact, they like authority. Just tell me what to do. In many ways, you know, I've, I feel their self-esteem is damaged. They have a lot of morbid responses, and, and they, they, they're not, I would think, you know, healthy from that perspective. The opposite is true for elite leaders. They have felt overconfident, entitled, arrogant, egocentric. They're well-educated, bright, and manipulative. And this pretty much sounds like any leader, right? I mean, you don't have to think of Nazi leaders. In fact, I would argue that like super leaders like uh, Winston Churchill, who's portrayed in this Oscar winning movie, The Darkest Hour, or even you know, when you look at Adolf Hitler, of, of whom 100 books were written on Adolf Hitler, and really nobody understands what, what Adolf Hitler is like. You know, when you get to the highest level of leadership, I actually think it's hard to understand it completely using our, our psychological theories um, whether that's true for Donald Trump, you can talk to me about that uh, at tonight's reception at the Swedish Embassy, but I feel that, that, that he may be part of that. But you know, Saddam Hussein, Bin Laden, Tito, Milosevic, 
all these super leaders, they're, they're tough to understand. And so really what I'm talking about is senior leadership, middle management, and rank and file. Um, anger management. I mean, they are terrorists are by definition violent. I was able to get to uh, Bosnia on a trip with the Pennsylvania National Guard. Uh, we're in this uh, prop plane going from Kaiserslautern to Bosnia. And um, I, I felt safe because there were a lot of generals on board, but this was the Puerto Rican National Guard, and that was their first flight over the Alps to Bosnia. And it's true, the guy on the right was looking at a map. <laughs> now, I go, how, how did I, as a personality assessment guy, why am I here? <laughs> and I was wondering if, if I die, if you guys would name a lecture after me. <laughs> yeah, and then it would be worth dying for, I mean. <laughs> So when I got there, I just saw this amazing place where everything was, everything was shot up. And um, you know, since 1995, the war, millions of people have been displaced. Everything's in shambles. They don't have a currency. They have, no, they have no electricity. There's no garbage removal system. I mean, what happened to this country? Uh, Bosnia is as big as Maine, the state of Maine. had just been torn apart by these three ethnic groups that once their leader, Tito, which is another super leader, once he passed away and, and the Balkans fragmented into all of these, these groups of, of countries, all hell broke loose and, 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 and people that felt more compelled to stick together within, within a group showed anger towards the other group. So, we, so there's this process that, that I, I'm comfortable with called within group love, outside group hate. So the more cohesive you become with your own group, you know, you can, you can see it in the sports world. I mean, Philadelphia, the city of champions, you might have heard, we just won the Super Bowl. So the, you know, the, more, you, the more you become cohesive, even in, in sports teams, you put on the same jersey, maybe even some of the same number of the quarterback. And then, and then I can see it when the Dallas Cowboys come into town and then somebody wears a Dallas Cowboys shirt, which is a bad idea, at Lincoln Financial Field and go, comes to the restroom. And there's like 30 Eagles guys and this guy. And then, Ultimately, there's no death or terrorism, but there's some words being exchanged outside group hate just because there were persons wearing a, a t-shirt. Of course, this is much more profound when, you, when it deals with religion and ideology. While in, uh, in Bosnia, we were just flying um, Black Hawk, Hawk helicopters, and the pilot asked me, do you want to fly high and slow or low and fast? And I was trained by Bob to be a researcher, so I said, I need more information. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, isn't it fun? I mean, I, I always feel like as a psychologist, you can get into these situations. So this uh, pilot, who couldn't have been more than 22 years old, he says, well, if we fly high, it's pretty safe because it's still a hostile combat zone. If somebody shoots at us, we can initiate evasive action. But if we're low, we got to fly fast, possibly at zero gravity. And I said to him, like, uh, let's, let's go high. <laughs> but what they didn't tell me is they kept the doors open. And I don't like heights. And you know, flooding does work. <laughs> I was scared to death, but after 15 minutes, I just went like, what the heck, man? I mean, it's just, you know. So on the way back, I said, let's go low and fast. And that was fun. <laughs> there were a couple of Drexel grads there, and I brought them some t-shirts. And um, I reflected with them on how this NATO, they were part of the NATO peacekeeping mission, uh, which included Russia. And they ran the entire country by email. But the thing I learned from Bosnia is that neighbor turned on neighbor while the world stood by. I mean, this was three hours by, by airplane from places like Germany, maybe the, and Sweden and Denmark, the most powerful and wealthiest countries in the world. If that can happen there, it can happen anywhere. My alumni, they were happy that they got basketball shirts, but they told me that, you know, Dr. Zilmer, this is great, but last week the Eagles cheerleader visited us. <laughs> so I had to compete with that, and of course, I would advise those two guys not to get a picture like that. But that's a great way to improve the morale of the troops, isn't it, in, the, in America, only in the USA. Problem solving style. I'm gonna to turn to the Taliban uh, on that. Um, the Taliban and Afghanistan presents many unique challenges and I mean, it truly is a foreign place. Uh, it's the size of Texas, it's politically, culturally complex the psychological stress on our groups are, our troops are great. I wrote a, uh, an op-ed in the CNN.com on, on the psychological toll of war. It is really a place where we probably should not be, and the Russians figured that out 20 years ago. 
And there is an IED that goes off every day. It doesn't even make the news anymore. And it's really very, very sad. And I teach military psychology at Drexel, and a quarter of the students who come into my class are veterans. And many of them have, uh, have, have, have uh, you know, PTSD and have been exposed either watching it or actually in these incidents. There's so many of them. What we're trying to do there is manage the Taliban. They're very difficult to manage because they um, hold the population in terror. They operate through threats, corruption, extortion, blackmail, and intimidation. They have specialized in asymmetrical warfare. They have a long mistrust of foreigners uh, invading Afghanistan. And we are looked at as, as, as outsiders, and uh, we actually don't really in interact with their communities. We're mostly housed in uh, temporary safe bases. And what I would, the reason I'm bringing this all up is their organizations look more like warlords. They're decentralized, but organized. They're very much like the mafia. And a warlord is a, is a leader who's able to exercise military control over his territory uh, because they have loyal armed forces and they, and they have, and they have a, a militia type uh, regime. And I think that's how you have to think of the Taliban. They're terrorists, but they're capitalists. And, and so, yeah, they have religious beliefs that are, you know, 15th century, but by and large, they, they are controlling their territory like the mafia controls city territories. So the best way to deal with them is probably to negotiate, uh, but it'll be hard to uh, upend them. I have a little intermezzo. I know this is a, uh, a tough talk. When you go to an Italian restaurant and you have a big meal, halfway through, they serve you gelato. But I'm serving you Bob Archer. I'm gonna say a couple. <laughs> all right, here, this is, this is, he's not a terrorist, okay? You know, I appreciate all of your skill and personality assessment, but sometimes you can just look at a person. <laughs> You don't need any of those, those tests. You just look at him. He looks like a nice guy. You don't need to do a terrorist evaluation. But on a serious note, I want to say something about this man. You know, there was a time when he was my supervisor during my internship when I worked at EVMS. And uh, we met often, and he taught me how to assess an individual's personality. And I have to tell you, you know, those meetings, they were fantastic. In fact, they were intoxicating. I would wait in front of his office. Uh, 15 minutes early as if I'm waiting for my favorite rock band to play. Bob, you are articulate, knowledgeable, you, were verbal, you are verbally gifted, you have an incredible talent for this. But what Bob really did is he made personality assessment fun. And he allowed me to be myself. He didn't go like, oh, you're wrong. He, he, it was really an experimentation and, and it really changed my life. I think of myself as a psychologist, no matter what uh, title I hold and work, and it really changed how I look at behavior. In fact, I feel that all of us have an unfair advantage. When I walk into a board meeting, I can tell who tells the truth and who lies. And I know everybody's an MPI profile by just looking at them. <laughs> and I hope that they have a couple of populars on the Rorschach. But I'm, reason, I'm bringing this up because as I look at you here today, the stakeholders of this society, you know, one, one thing that you have to do for this society is create a community like Bob did, which was a safe neighborhood for me to, to explore personality assessment, to go on this incredible journey. And as I stand here before you today, I have to tell you that this uh, journey was intellectually and emotionally fully satisfying. It's really one of the best choices I ever made. And so it's great to be here. And thank you so much. I, you know, it's such a great um, honor to say these things to you publicly. So I appreciate that, thank you. So I'm gonna move on with my uh, presentation. Lone Wolf, that's not Bob Archer. We're now talking by. <laughs> you know, lone wolves are interesting to me because they, um, there's been a real increase in uh, lone wolf perpetrators. I mean, gosh. And, and so uh, a lone wolf, of course, is a terrorist who commits a violent act outside any command structure. Uh, this may be motivated by ideology or, or belief of an external group. A couple examples would be Stephen Paddock, who opened fire at Las Vegas, or just the uh, shooting we had at Parkland, Florida, which was uh, so sad. I got involved in analyzing this one pilot who, drew, who flew a German 
German wing airplane into the French Alps. You might, might remember that. And he locked out the pilot when he went to the bathroom. And the pilot couldn't get back in. The plane's full, going from Spain to Germany. And he just, he just, he just flew it right into the mountains, killing everybody on board. And I wrote a column for CNN.com on this. And I found out that this co-pilot, he had bipolar disorder. And we know that uh, normal people without diagnoses are much more violent than people with mental illness. But in this case, it was treated. And, and, and in Germany, they have such strong HIPAA laws that they, even if there's danger against others, they would not report it. They're not required to report it. So when, when they was uncovered, it was clear that, you know, that he, did, he did suffer from mental illness. He became paranoid and manic. And he planned this without telling anybody. I think he's a good example of the lone wolf because he planned this alone in his head. In fact, I feel that the planning actually gives him more satisfaction of control than actually the execution of it. There's a, in his case, there is uh, evidence of, of, of mental illness. In other cases, there is evidence of criminality. Lone wolves are usually not stable people. And if he wasn't a lone wolf, if he would tell 10 of his friends to do this, Many of his friends would have said, you're crazy. We're not going to do that. We're not going to get an airplane and fly it into the French Alps. So, but they're keeping it to themselves. This becomes a problem. And you look at the Boston Marathon, which is not a lone wolf. It's two. But I would consider it a lone wolf because they're, they're two brothers. And they, uh, uh, you know, they, they committed this crime, which left uh, three people dead and, and 16 people without limbs. And this movie, Patriot Day, is, is, covers this incident. And, and so these are brothers who are, who are prepared to die for another. Also, they had a history of being on the terrorist watch list. Again, they also, they also had, they were picked up by the FBI. Uh, they were looked at, but, but, not, but not pursued. Another case is uh, Eric Freen, who I was involved in. I was hired by the district attorney of Pennsylvania, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, to represent the Commonwealth. He was sentenced to death for the murder of a Pennsylvania state police officer. He was arrested and spent time in jail many years ago. Again, uh, not like what I just showed you. The average Al Qaeda operative has never been to jail. You know, these lone wolves, they, they, they get into the system. They, they fall into the cracks, and, and something happens with them. He was also accused of terrorism, and, uh, which really wasn't necessary. I mean, it was clearly he killed a police officer with a 308 Winchester rifle uh, while the person was in uniform to start a revolution. And so these lone wolves are, are interesting. And I, and I think I'm going to pull all this together now in my last slides to show you how I conceptualize the lone wolves and the organized terrorism and the leaders and the followers. I'm going to start off with my own uh, chart of my department. I am the athletic director. I'm supposed to be today in Cleveland with my wrestlers and in Indianapolis with my swimmers. And tonight, we're playing in the NIT. But when Bob asked me to come here, this it's always the first week of March Madness. I said, I got to be here. And uh, I have, I run an athletics department uh, at Drexel University, Division One. I. I have 400 employees. This is our organizational chart. I don't like it, but my, my staff likes it. You look at it, it's very linear. Like theoretically, if I'm not there, because I'm at the top, things wouldn't work. But actually, it's just the opposite. It works better. But theoretically, like you take something out, uh, they couldn't you wouldn't be able to function. This would represent also how a state organization like the Third Reich would have functioned. It was very organized and, um, and, and very linear. Now, look, compare that to Al Qaeda. This is a declassified slide of network of operative links of Al Qaeda. And you look at the left cell, and that's why they're called terrorist cells. There's 19 people, and you see the name Atta. I told you he's the leader. They're mostly talking to each other, OK? And it's a much more decentralized form of communication. But we know from, from intelligence that Atta also talked to bin Laden and some other of the operatives. You see there's a couple connections and emails that were found between him and bin Laden. And so this, so this, this organizational structure is totally different. So you could, you could take somebody out of the system, but you may, not, you may not be able to figure it out. And then there's some terrorist cells on the right that have no connection to the, to the other world. They're home, what we call homegrown. So it would be very hard to infiltrate them. So this is why terrorism is so difficult to, to, uh, to fight, because they don't look like this. Okay, Athletics Department, Al-Qaeda. 
And so, so this system is something we worked on, and this is what, how intelligence service would look at. But then ISIS came out, and, and they, they managed things a little different, and, and we had to, or I had to reconceptualize my model. And I feel actually now the model, the hierarchy looks like this, like, a, like, a, like somebody shot like a shotgun of bullets into a target. And so at the middle of this new hierarchical structure, in my opinion, you have international terrorism. It's a calculated business model. These are core terrorists. They don't show any striking predisposition towards terrorism. Their most common characteristic is that they look, they look normal. I mean, how else could you live in Florida and, and practice how to fly a plane? You know, they, they come through airport security. They live in foreign countries undetected. These, these are people who have, are not crazy. They don't have a mental health history. history. They don't have a criminal history. Those, they're least likely to do harm individually, but when they do collectively, it's very, very dangerous. And these people are very dangerous because the terrorist perpetrator act seems to be a reasonable and necessary part of a rational strategy. In other words, they have calculated benefits. They follow risk-reward ratios just like you and I do when we go through our daily lives. That's the core. Uh, I would call it a core uh, organized terrorism. They're a very formidable enemy. Now, you look at the periphery. They're further out from the organizational structure. And all the way out there, what I would, be called, what I would call the lone wolf attacks. I call it terrorism by proxy. This is something that ISIS invented. You know, there's never been like, nobody's ever watched like a TV or go on online and then actually find a way to, to uh, become a terrorist. It metastasizes. And they feel that solidarity, these people who commit these acts, some of them, through, through the internet. Mohamed Bouchel is a great example. He's the guy who drove the, uh, the bus on Bastille Day into a crowd in Nice, killing 86 people. He self-radicalized. There's no evidence to get any contact with anybody. And so what ISIS has done, in a way, through a PR campaign, is get these riffraff people with criminal histories. All of these things are in play with those people. Poverty, broken families, education, immaturity, unemployed. All of these things are in play that you see, but, and now they, they've recruited them electronically. This is really a new, this is a new form of terrorism. Now uh, then, what about a group like this? This is the, uh, the Belgian group that, uh, um, that uh, had two bombs at a Brussels airport in 2016. You see the two guys on the left, they have, their suitcases are full of bombs. They're wearing two gloves on the left hand, you see two black gloves, none on the right hand. The guy on the right is the operative. He, 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 he survived. People don't know why they had these gloves on, but I'm thinking that the person on the right didn't know them, and he was looking for two people that only had one glove on, and those were the ones that he was going to cooperate with and set off the explosives. My point is, these are highly organized people. This is a highly organized uh, affair. and. Um, and 32 civilians perished, but it was not commanded by a central ISIS. They took responsibility for it, so I would say they're somewhere in the middle. So when you look at this model, that psychological concepts of loyalty are true for all of these terrorists, that attachment sacrifice plays a common and important role in the recruitment of terrorists. I hope my lecture today showed you that terrorists are very formidable than we thought. They represent a rational uh, as well as an irrational enemy at times. And uh, that they can only exist uh, if they're sympathizers and that what we need to do is marginalize uh, terrorists through working with, with moderate uh, people who support them. I thank you for inviting me.